Thank you all for being here. We're talking about biodiversity today, uh, and in particular, on the ground work to conserve biodiversity. Uh, in an urban and urbanizing region like the Bay Area, the name of the biodiversity game is restoring and kind of reconnecting ecosystem function. And we're going to hear about what that looks like on the ground. Um, but before we get to our speakers, I want to make um, take this opportunity to make a quick announcement, some exciting news. Together Bay Area was recently awarded a grant from the State Coastal Conservancy for five years of work on the Bay Area Conservation Lands Network, or CLN, as we call it. Um, the CLN is a collaborative regional vision for conserving biodiversity in the Bay Area. Um, that's the nine counties of the Bay Area plus Santa Cruz. And the CLN provides the science and mapping and tools to, to conserve together um, collect, collectively 50% of the Bay Area by 2050. Um, and we just put a link in the chat to learn more about the CLN. So click that link. Um, the focus of the upcoming five-year work plan will be certainly updating the regional habitat goals with new fine-scale vegetation mapping and collectively work um, to establish regional stewardship and landscape climate change resilience goals, um, things that we're super excited about and feel are sort of the next frontier for conservation as a discipline, but certainly for the Bay Area. We'll kick things off with a progress report toward the existing regional habitat. Um, we'll publish that about a year from now. It'll be a reflection of, of your conservation work over the last five years, and we'll show which habitat goals we've collectively met and which habitats need more help. Um, sort of in a together Bay Area way, we're gonna be doing all of this work collaboratively with you all. Um, CLN 2.0, the current version, had about 150 participants. That's you know, practitioners and experts from around the Bay Area. For CLN 3.0, this next batch of, of work, we're shooting to double that participation. And I really hope that that includes many of you on this call. All right, so right now we're gonna hear from th uh, about three projects from practitioners from three member organizations. Uh, as we go, I'm gonna ask you to um, post your questions in the chat. We are gonna monitor that and collect them and then we'll address them in the Q&A period after the presentations. So with that, please join me in welcoming our first presenter, uh, Dina Robertson. She's a Wildland Vegetation Program Manager at East Bay Regional Park District. And she's gonna talk about their program about uh, managing vegetation and monitoring. Uh, welcome, Dina. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, let me uh, turn on the PowerPoint show. Okay. Are you seeing the presentation? Looks perfect. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. So I have 10 minutes. Here we go. Uh, so as Tom said, my name is Dina Robertson. I work for the East Bay Regional Park District, uh, which is out in the East Bay. Uh, our parks are in Alameda and Contra Costa counties and have about 125,000 acres. And today I'm going to talk to you about biodiversity and livestock ponds in the East Bay Regional Park District. I'm in the Wildland Vegetation Program. And I work very closely with a whole team around livestock ponds, which you're going to hear a lot about. And I hope you learn something new and, and look at them differently next time you're out hiking and, and see a, a pond. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge a few people that I work with that's been that are instrumental to managing ponds for our wildlife um, and for our livestock. Uh, Allison Rofe, Tammy Lim, uh, Ed Culver, Dave Renshi, and Natalie Reeder. And there's others, but I just want to mention them. Okay. So Briefly, what we are going to talk about today. Uh, we're gonna to talk about biodiversity, why it matters, what a livestock pond is, where they're found, are there lots of them, are they natural? What do they have to do with biodiversity? And what are the challenges uh, with managing for ponds? And what East Bay Regional Park District and others in the East Bay are doing for these ponds and what more needs to be done? That's what we're gonna talk about. I have these little circles. Those are livestock ponds up there in the picture, circled in red. So briefly, because I think most people on the call know about biodiversity, but we'll just go over it. Um, 
biodiversity is the variety of life on earth um, and all at all of its levels and the processes that sustain life. I'm gonna circle a few here. We're gonna talk in particular about some of these species. Uh, I won't name them, we'll just talk about them later, but a lot of our amphibian species that live in the ponds right, are actually dependent on the ponds. The Bay Area. So we are one of 35 globally recognized biodiversity hotspots. And the San Francisco Bay Area is certainly one of those very important hotspots within the hotspot. Uh, we have a high level of ende endemism, which are plants and animals species that occur nowhere else but in San Francisco Bay Area or California. And there's a significant reservoir of biodiversity here in the Bay Area. One other thing about the, bio the biodiversity in the Bay Area, we have such a range of conditions that uh, influence biodiversity. We have distance from the coast, we have geologies, uh, different soil types, all sorts of things that result in uh, a large amount of biodiversity. It's a unique place. A little bit about context of where we're out. Uh, Pre-colonization California, the Bay Area was home to a diverse number of different tribes and languages. So not only are the plants and animals diverse, but the people who have lived here and who still live here are very diverse. And the Bay Area has changed. As we all know, um, there were once what were extensive wetlands uh, in the East Bay and the Livermore Valley um, on the coasts of the Straits. Um, and uh, those, we also had many species that don't exist anymore today, such as the grizzly bear and many others. We don't have things like the sky turning black with migratory birds in the sky that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, although we still have birds and a lot of species uh, that are worth protecting for sure. And there are tribal people who still live here and are still connected to the land and still um, are keepers of, of their knowledge and ways. A little bit more on historic. Now we're talking about more pre-colonial history. Um, I mentioned the extensive wetlands. Uh, a lot of, uh, I think California, the statistic is 95% of the wetlands are not around anymore. Uh, the Bay Area certainly has lost a good portion of them and they've been altered by our agriculture and urbanization. Uh, and ponds, livestock ponds, and there's a picture of a pond in the bottom here. I, I hope you can see my cursor. That's a livestock pond. So it's a, it's a, it's a, usually they're artificial. There are, that are holes <laughs> that have been dug in the ground to hold water for long periods, longer periods of time than if it was just to come out and go back into the earth. And those ponds were built historically for livestock during the 1940s. In the 1950s, we had huge numbers of ponds built, um, encouraged by the Soil Conservation Service for uh, landowners to make, to make these ponds. And they don't last forever, about 20 to 50 years, and they need to be fixed. The, the dams break, they, they're full of silt, normal processes. These ponds are important for livestock, certainly, to be able to water livestock and move them about in the landscape, spread them out. But they're also incredibly important for wildlife. And we'll talk a lot more about this in this talk. And um, the, the picture on the right is just a little bit more about what maybe some of the more natural areas uh, that hadn't been, haven't been impounded look like. I don't have any pictures of what the East Bay wetlands used to look like someday. If anybody has one, please send it to me. I would love to put it in one of these talks because pictures really, really are uh, moving. They help you understand what topic you're, you're, you're focusing on. So district ponds. So this map shows the East Bay, Alameda and Contra Costa County. And the dark green are East Bay Regional Park District lands. The light green are other uh, large areas of open space that are undeveloped. Uh, so the blue dots are livestock ponds. And hopefully you can see those and kind of see the distribution. And we have over 600 uh, livestock ponds in the park on park district lands alone, there are more than a thousand in the East Bay on other, including other land managers and private landowners. This one just really quickly. Uh, so I zoomed. So this picture, I zoomed into this area by Pleasanton Ridge. So that's here, and then I I, I deleted a little red here to to focus in on. So in the middle are the old. Um, 
the ranchos in the East Bay, there were many of them. And you can see where the red triangle, the, I'm sorry, this, the rectangle is here is that same area by Pleasanton Ridge. And then I zoomed into it on the right and you can see that area used to be Thule Swamp and Willow Thicket. So this is just one area, but you could imagine there were a lot more of these throughout the East Bay area. And then now that same area that I've zoomed into looks like this. So it's housing and freeways and things like that. And there's very little wetlands that are that are left in that area. I promise this isn't gonna be a total downer presentation. I <laughs> just, just wanted to put some context. So why are ponds important? Biodiversity, for sure. Um, we'll talk more about that. Just a lot of species and, and endangered listed threatened species rely on ponds for uh, reproduction. If we didn't have the ponds, then they would be having a really tough time. We, uh, the ponds are important for supporting our conservation grazing program in the park district. We graze for the benefit of species and habitats and for fuels management. And our livestock ponds are essential to be able to have livestock on the landscape. We cannot have sheep or cattle, in particular cattle, without uh, water, permanent water sources. Groundwater recharge is another function of ponds. And uh, as I mentioned about biodiversity, these that are in them. Biodiversity. Conservation grazing, uh, as I mentioned, it's grazing to benefit natural resources and fuels management and weed control. Uh, Non-native invasive plants, uh, very much so. Uh, but wildlife habitat. So uh, lots of wildlife rely on our ponds, but we do have three in particular that you'll uh, that we want you to know about if you don't already: the California tiger salamander, California red-legged frog, and the western pond turtle are three uh, listed species. So that either means uh, you know they're they're uncommon or they're actually state or federally listed. So those, those species rely on our ponds. Uh, one, just for a moment to talk about it, California tiger salamander, they really like, we have research for this, is they like short grass and they like burrows. So the, the California ground squirrel is very important for the tiger salamander because when they're not in the pond reproducing, they're up in the uplands in the, in the burrows. And here's a little video just showing one of these ponds. It doesn't look like much, but if you look closely, in this muddy pond, there's a little tiger salamander that will come out. So they're hidden. And one of the reasons they're hidden is because it's all mucked up from the cows. And that's what they like, because then the raccoons and other wildlife don't see them in the water. So it's an interesting relationship between the cattle and the water and the tiger salamander. Other, there's lots of wildlife. So others are the, the toads, the newts. They're in the middle, you can see this big ball of newts. Um, garter snakes and tree frogs and all sorts of, of insects. It's, there's a lot going on in these, these livestock ponds. More wildlife, we had some cameras out and we're gonna be getting more, more pictures, hopefully of wildlife use of our ponds. Uh, some pictures here of coyote and raccoons. Uh, and then, of course, the frogs and the, the snakes. So what would happen if we didn't repair and manage our livestock ponds? Like I said, there's a lot of them, and I'll, you'll hear some of the challenges to managing for them. But we would lose the open water habitat that's suitable for breeding for our species and have negative impacts to the species. Some of them might be able to hang on to some a certain extent, but uh, the water just wouldn't be ponding as long uh, for them to be able to breed. We'd have less standing water for common wildlife for drinking, limited water for conservation grazing, and an increase in fine fuels and weeds because we wouldn't be able to graze uh, a lot of land without our ponds because we can't bring water, municipal water to them or develop wells. They just, they just wouldn't have grazing. So some of the challenges we have with managing ponds are maintenance and repair. I mentioned that they, uh, uh, they don't last a, a whole, a very, very long time. So they always have to be repaired. And permitting constraints, we have significant constraints to working in ponds because of the permitting requirements to do so. Uh, the, the ranchers that uh, 
came just before us who uh, were maybe owned the land before the park district did, they would just go out and dig holes and fix the pond without too much ado. And uh, so they were able to keep up with all these ponds, but we can't really do that now. <laughs> uh, it's a much more complicated than just going out with the backhoe and digging a hole. Uh, so it really uh, doesn't allow for very many repairs on our part. Extreme climactic events, back-to-back uh, -back atmospheric rivers, we remember those. That's definitely a challenge for our ponds. Uh, drought that happens year after year after year. Uh, monitoring costs to go out and figure out where our species are uh, takes a lot of time and effort. Um, pond restoration costs, just a note here, 25,000 to 150 or more for just one pond. So 600 ponds, think about the cost of that. And then um, invasive species are also a challenge for uh, managing the ponds because they uh, like to eat the native species. Uh, and we can't build new ponds. Again, permitting wise, it's really not a feasible thing. So we work with what we have. Drought, uh, we did have some die off of our uh, sensitive species during the last drought, uh, in particular with Western pond turtles, when those ponds just dried up and it, there wasn't enough for them to be able to survive. Um, many of our ponds never filled during the drought. Uh, some positive things is drought did kill off a number of invasive species in our ponds because they were once perennial and then the water went away and all the invasives went away. And then the next year when the ponds filled up, we had listed species that had never been documented uh, during our time of monitoring in the ponds. So there, and, huh. and there has also been shown to be some good uh, resilience in the species to drought. Uh, but if we have more droughts back to back, that's the concern. It's the climate change and the more extreme events that maybe are more more frequent. So it's sort of like fires. Fire is good, but maybe you don't want, you know, big fires every year and then mm -hmm. you're going to have a negative effect. Atmospheric rivers, I think it speaks for itself. These pictures, lots of rain, we get mm -hmm. blown out in bank bits and it's uh, not good. Mesa species, non-native fish, American bullfrogs, again, th these are the ones that like to eat the little See uh, tiger salamanders and red-legged frog uh, larvae and adults. Okay, so shifting to positive. So we are working on our ponds and our pond work would not be possible without our partners and our grazing tenants are our number one partners and getting this done. So we partner with them to be able to get funding and repair ponds and get the permits. The other partners are here listed, the Natural Resource Conservation District and the Alameda County and Contra Costa RCDs, critical people for helping us. So I'm really appreciative of all the work that they do um, to help us with ponds. Dina, thank you so much. All right, I'm out of time. That's, uh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for rooting us in the biodiversity topic so well and just you know, telling an incredible story about the human, you know, the role these human made ponds play in the persistence of these, uh, you know, water dependent species. Um, now we're going to hear from Aaron Abair, uh, Natural Resources Manager of Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. He's going to talk about their management work on the Mayan Oyakma Coyote uh, Ridge Open Space Preserve. Welcome, Aaron. Hi. Uh, let me get my screen share going here. Mm -hmm. uh, bear with me. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Can folks see it? Yes, we can. And just a reminder, uh, please post uh, questions in the chat, folks. Thank you. All right, Aaron, take it away. Great. Well, welcome all. Uh, my name is Aaron Abair. I'm the Natural Resources Manager here at the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. I'm going to be talking about Mayono Yakma Coyote Ridge Open Space Preserve. This preserve was given its name by our partners at the Muwekma Ohlone Tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, Mayona Yakima means Coyote Ridge, quite literally, in their native Chichenyo language. Um, under the theme of biodiversity and conservation, I'm going to be talking about people, flowers, and butterflies. Uh, my goal today is to share what I'd like to think are a couple of innovative ways of managing public access uh, and habitat uh, and our adaptive management program in service of biodiversity. So, um, Mayanayakma is about 15 minutes south of downtown San Jose, so pretty close to about a million people. It's just beyond the urban limits and is a core part of our conservation work in Coyote Valley, which aims to create a habitat linkage between the Diablo and Santa Cruz Mountains. That is connecting about 1 million acres of habitat. You can see Coyote Valley behind me in my Zoom screen. 
Um, an easy way to think about our work in Coyote Valley is uh, linking a million acres of habitat and a million people. Here at Mayana Yakma, we manage the preserve in two separate units, the gateway and the habitat protection area or ridge. The gateway is that little inset and the ridge is the main trail. The gateway is where we've concentrated our visitors and amenities and doing our educational programming. It's got easy access trails and some really great habitat for folks to get up close and personal with. The habitat protection area consists of a five mile loop trail through some of the best spring wildflowers in all of the Bay Area and is the core part of the Bay of the Butterfly habitat. Much of the property is a serpentine grassland and hosts many rare and rare and protected plants and native species. The story of Coyote Ridge as a special place goes back millennia with indigenous people, but I'm going to start in the early 1990s to ground us in some of the conservation science. Uh, Stu Weiss's seminal work, Cars, Cows, and Checkerspot Butterflies, laid the foundation for how nitrogen pollution caused the mass fertilization of our grasslands and how that process impacts species like the Bay Checkerspot Butterfly through the increased growth of non-native grasslands. Stu has forgotten more conservation science than I've ever learned. His work ultimately drove the protection of Coyote Ridge and one of the main drivers for the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Conservation Plan, which funds much of the habitat work at Mayana Ayakma through the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency. The serpentine grassland is so rich with rare plants and species that I don't have time to list them all. I will say it is one of the most beautiful places in the spring that you will ever go. After OSA acquired the land, we undertook a pretty rigorous process to figure out where to provide ecologically sensitive public recreation. Ultimately, that meant reusing much of the existing ranch road system, except for the construction of about one and a half miles of single track trail that takes users into the wildflowers. The preserve open to the public this August. Our North Star in terms of habitat protection is the Bay Checkerspot butterfly and its associated habitat, as well as some very rare plants. The main way to ensure the protection of those species and habitats from recreation is to keep people on the trail, minimize and manage invasive species, and prevent folks from directly touching or harming the butterflies or the Santa Clara Valley Dudleya, which is unfortunately sometimes poached by plant collectors. In order to best protect the butterfly, we made several top level management decisions. First, that we'd oper operate the preserve differently when the butterfly was in its critical life stages. Second, that we'd manage the habitat protection area and the core of the butterfly habitat through a butterfly pass system that I'll explain more about later. So here in this chart, you can see a somewhat complex management system during butterfly season, November through May, the preserve is open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. so that there is enough thermal gain from the sun to let the butterflies move if people encounter them. These hours also reduce total usage, which is a, a benefit to the species. The habitat protection area is also closed on Mondays and Tuesdays. This provides the species with a bit of a break from people, and it's a low point of our recreational use generally. It also allows OSA to conduct restoration while the public isn't there. One of the important points is that we need to get off the trail to manage the habitats. And I wanted to minimize the public seeing OSA staff off trail because that would appear to, to be counter to our main message, which is to, of course, stay on the trail. Most people will ultimately want to visit Mayana Yakma to take pictures of wildflowers. We expect a ton of interest each spring. In order to ensure high usage doesn't mean high impact, the public can only access the habitat protection area using docent led hikes during wildflower season. The rest of the year when it's quite hot and the butterfly is dormant, we have more typical preserve hours. The gateway, that staging area is open seven days a week and we hope to invest in the gateway as a kind of wildflower gar garden to concentrate use. So as you can see, this is quite complex. It's not as complex as ecology or the species in question here, but this plan seeks to tailor a unique public access experience to a unique place. I mentioned that in order to access the habitat protection area, you need a butterfly pass. The butterfly pass is a free, easy to get access pass that is also available in Spanish and, and Vietnamese. The goal was simple, to have a low friction access pass that aims to do more than signage can do. 
Our goal is to make sure visitors understand how special this place is. And by getting them to say, yes, I understand this is special, we're hoping to make sure recreation is as compatible as it can be. My own personal mission here is to change the way people relate to the land. I've grown as an ecologist from focusing on the science and the how and what of conservation science to firmly believing that each and every person's relationship to the land is how we save special places like this. So for me, everything we do in this Together Bay Area community must be a step towards reshaping people's relationship to the land. And yet, most folks are coming to take selfies with wildflowers. So how do we use this opportunity to protect the habitat and work towards that future where we all have that shared stewardship ethic? An innovative part of this system is, to mon is the monitoring our staff and volunteers are doing using an app called Survey123, which is an ArcGIS sort of Google form-like thing that you can put on your phone. Simply said, our staff and volunteers patrol the habitat protection area and engage visitors in discussions about what makes this place special. This part of the management plan really comes from um, Edgewood County Park in San Mateo and Friends of Edgewood that do a lot of great um, engagement with visitors using people power. Each interaction about the butterfly pass is logged into the system and any observations of issues with trails, signage, or misbehavior also get logged into this system. There's also a whole other parallel world of habitat monitoring that I won't get into today because it's probably more familiar to this audience. What's different here is the extent of engagement and monitoring we do around people and recreation. There's also data collected at the gateway, which is more about the numbers of visitors and the administration of the butterfly pass. Uh, special credit to our wonderful GIS staff, Anna McGarrickel, for teaching me about technology and um, being a thought partner in managing the land. This data is then aggregated into an ArcGIS database system, and we have this online web-based dashboard for myself and our operations team to monitor. It's both a ticketing system for maintenance issues and our monitoring basis database. For example, folks like to dump trash outside of the preserve, and we get notices through, that, through the app about that. Staff and volunteers can escalate issues to our attention or simply just add to the data. This allows us to get real data about what's working and not working and to have that broken down by time of year, user group, and location. This data collection is a different ask for our field staff and volunteers, but they are excited about doing this work and fully enrolled in protecting the habitat through this system. This data ultimately feeds into an adaptive management cycle. Uh, we monitor throughout the year with a focus on butterfly season and high use season, and then work up the data and gather qualitative information from our stakeholders, staff, volunteers, our grazing tenant, and advising scientists like Stu. We'll use these data and stories like that to make adjustments that could be small things like in the example here or bigger things that might need be needed if our management isn't working. Our goal, of course, is to get it right from the beginning, and I hope you see the thought and care here, but uh, any good ecologist will tell you we don't know a lot of things and all you can do is learn as you go. So to restate, we have a unique public access system with the Butterfly Pass, which aims to reinforce the right kinds of recreation, a sophisticated monitoring program that enlists all staff and volunteers in the collective goal of doing right by the land, and a deliberate and humble adaptive management program. Um, so with that, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you. Aaron, thank you so much. Clearly, you all are courageously bridging the science practice gap, which is such a challenge. Um, and thanks also for sharing your personal goal of, you know, reshaping people's relationship with the land and wildlife. That's wonderful. And the innovative use of uh, volunteered observation by visitors, really neat. Okay, we'll finish with John McCall, who's a land acquisition director at Sonoma Land Trust. Um, John's going to talk about restoring wetlands at the recent Camp 4 Ranch ac acquisition by the Sonoma Land Trust. Um, which is at the mouth of Sonoma Creek, where it meets the San Pablo Bay. John, welcome. Hey, Tom, thanks everybody. Let's do. Here we go. Looks like we're operational here. Looks good. Great. Hi everyone. My name is John McCall. I'm the land acquisition director for Sonoma Land Trust. We're going to switch gears here from land management 
um, how to enhance biodiversity on land that's already protected to the early stage, to the beginning of the process. Um, I'm going to focus in on a property that we just purchased effect, uh, as of September 1st. So brand new ownership for Sonoma Land Trust. This property is called Camp 4. It's down in the Sonoma Creek watershed, as Tom mentioned. The photo on the left is what it looks like now. The photo on the right is hopefully where we're going to get to. Um, to orient everyone geographically, you can see here the northern extent of the San Pablo Bay, Highway 37. There are two watersheds that Sonoma Land Trust has been studying for tidal marsh, primarily tidal marsh restoration. That's the Sonoma Creek watershed, which is outlined in, in red here, and the Petaluma River, which is outlined in the gold orange color. So both of these areas were extensively modified in the 1850s. The Swamp Land Act of 1850 allowed for a reclamation of what were extensive tidal marshes through levee development, dredging. So this area has been heavily modified. I'm sure you, many of you have been through here, but if you get up into the watershed in both of these, these systems, um, what was once a very interconnected habitat is now a series of mostly um, islands and, and farms that have been levied and diked and um, disconnected from tidal influence. So very flood prone, uh, habitat values have been significantly diminished and the land is subsiding. A lot of this, if you've been through the Delta, there's some similar things going on in this landscape um, to the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. To uh, set the context for the Camp 4 property, one of the most important documents that's come out for San Francisco Bay is the Baylands Ecosystem Habitat Goals Report uh, in 2015. This report set a broad vision for, by 2030, that we would restore significant portions of our tidal marsh ecosystems in the Bay. It set uh, specific goals for different habitat types, but also concepts like designing complexity and connectivity back into the system and bringing full tidal action back up into the system. Uh, how to how much can water get from the bay through the movement of tides up into la a landscape that's been heavily modified. So using the Baylands Habitat Goals Report as our guide star, as our leading science document, the Land Trust and San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority, the Estuary Institute, produced the Sonoma Creek Bayland Strategy back in 2020. The map on the right shows a series of restoration actions that, that we're planning. Um, you can see Camp 4, which is what we're going to talk about more in a minute, is this property here. All of the blue channels that you see, those are going to need to be dredged. Those do, do not exist right now. So there's a series of actions, levee removal, uh, dredging new channels. And this is a restoration vision for about 10,000 acres of land. Uh, one more piece on, on Sonoma Creek. There's a lot of flooding that occurs not just in, in particularly rainy years, but almost every year, there's some flooding along states, uh, highways 12 and 121 just south of the town of Sonoma, as well as highway 12 and the smart uh, train tracks that run through here. Part of our work is not just habitat restoration, but mitigating flood damage and risk to local communities. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of ancillary benefits on that front as well. So camp four. Um, the why is it called camp uh, is a good starting place. So in the 1880s, um, again, there was the Swamp Land Act of 1850 that allowed for uh, people to start reclaiming baylands. There was a, a senator, a state senator Jones uh, in the 1880s who purchased dredgers and, and basically re reclaimed about 15,000 acres of land in Sonoma Creek watershed. The camps of which there's camp three, camp four, camp two, um, were the actual labor camps. So historically you had thousands of workers. Um, this, the hay, this was all hay farming, even going back to that era, which actually fed the San Francisco transportation system, which was force-based. So we, this area was producing huge amounts of hay. 
that fuels San Francisco's growth and, and movement. Still to this day, um, the land has been dry farm uh, for hay production. The Camp 4 property, I just wanted to go into a minute or two on the details of how we purchased it. So the Natural Resources Conservation Service was our main funding partner. Uh, they purchased a wetland reserve easement on the property, which requires it to be taken out of agriculture and restored to, to wetlands. And then funding from the Restoration Authority and the Moore Foundation allowed us to buy the underlying fee. And it's a $21 million 10 year project to get it restored to Tidal Marsh. Um, thankfully, funding from NRCS and the Restoration Authority will allow not just for the acquisition, but for restoration. Uh, Land Trust is going to hold the property for at least 10 years. Our goal is to get it transferred into the National Wildlife Refuge System uh, as soon as the service can, can take it on. But we're, we're committed to owning it and managing it for now. Just zooming in um, more, uh, you can see here on a scale level, there's seven miles of levee around this project. I don't have great pictures of wildlife because this is bare bare dirt most of the year or stubble. Um, it's dry farm. So of course there's some habitat value, but if you look just to the north of the property, you can see this is all land owned by Cal Fish and Wildlife as part of their managed wildlife area. You get up on the levee, you can see all the waterfowl um, and shorebirds and plant life that healthy tidal marsh supports. Um, so we have, a, we have a clear vision of what it can look like right next door. Um, the challenge for us is stewardship. Again, I don't have great wildlife pictures, but I do have great flood pictures. And bottom left-hand corner is the entire Camp 4 property in 2019 underwater. Levy breached it. Um, that can start to show you how big it is. Uh, the top left-hand corner is a zoom out. Um, same year, you can see flooding occurred throughout the whole system there. Um, the property is, for the most part, uh, just empty. Um, there's a few old structures that we have to tear down. Um, this is interesting after after Aaron's presentation because, you know, this land is not going to really be for recreational use. Um, NRCS limits how we can, uh, how much recreation can occur on the property. There can be passive recreation. In the long run, there's a, a dream of a water trail that Sonoma County Regional Parks uh, has for the bay that you could navigate through sloughs on kayaks or canoes or paddle boards and get through or past some of these properties. But um, this one's going to be for the birds and for the wildlife. Um, we have a small area where there's uh, will there be some staging and, and management, but for the most part, this is going to be underwater um, or at least under uh, tidal influence. So um, the this is going to be replicated. That's that's my main message closing up here is that you know this is a thousand acre property, which is a huge undertaking for us, but several adjacent properties we're negotiating with the landowners right now. Um, we are at a scale of beginning to plan for restoration design. So hopefully my next presentation in a couple of years will have uh, slides of what that restored habitat looks like. Um, I'm going to stop there and happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, John. Thanks for taking us uh, on a, uh, a journey into what it looks like at the very beginning of a, a restoration project. We're going to go right into Q&A, and I'm going to ask um, my colleague, Annie Burke, to lead us in Q&A. Great. Thank you. And thank you. Please, everybody, join me in thanking John, Aaron, and Dina for their presentations. Um, so, so interesting and helpful. And um, there's so many questions that I have, and I'm sure others have. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and I want to start off with a question. Um, we're just going to take a few minutes. I should say that we probably have two hours worth of questions and discussions that we could do, and we're going to do that another time. John, I also want to say that you're coming back to Together Bay Area to present before five years or seven years. So, you know, you said the next time, and I just want to clarify that that's maybe not the next time. Um, uh, we have a question from the Dr. Stuart Weiss in the chat for Aaron and Adina. Um, can you talk about the reconciliation and conflicts of conservation, grazing, and public access? And maybe we could start with you, Dina, and then go to Aaron. Sure. 
Um, so conservation grazing. We have something about 45 tenants that we work with across 88,000 acres. So we have a pretty complex grazing program and uh, we are a park and recreation uh, district. So uh, it is a balance that we are trying to achieve is balancing recreation and conservation. And grazing um, can sometimes be mostly compatible and sometimes not. So we, one of the biggest things that we're doing uh, is to uh, develop infrastructure that will help us to move cattle away from people where we can, uh, or to rotate cattle in a way that avoids conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, we spend a lot of time in the park district. We just don't, we have a, a backlog of projects. Um, and so we've just been chiseling away at those. And um, there's more to it, but it's, you know, we work with the biking community where we can, it's a slow process, but that's, that's the main way we're going about it is really trying to put in the infrastructure so we can move the livestock in a way that is uh, not in conflict with recreation. Awesome. Thank you, Dina. Aaron? Yeah, you know, I think um, similarly situated, similar set of issues, I'll say that Open Space Authority also has an agricultural mission. Um, is we're not exactly a park district, um, you know, sort of a open space. So um, for us, conservation grazing and is, is an essential tool to maintain our grasslands, which is the, the dominant ecosystem of the Open Space Authority's holdings, um, particularly essential in our serpentine grasslands. So um, you know, for us, it's a it's a management tool. It, it obviously has an agricultural element. Um, there, there are some conflicts over time, but it's, you know, mostly something we do through adaptive management and conversation with our grazing tenant, like they're damaging the trails, we need more fencing, you know, these, these types of engagement. So it's not, they're not really opposed, they're, they're pretty compatible, um, and they take work to manage in a, in a compatible way. Great, thank you. John, is there anything you want to add? Maybe not cattle per se, but agriculture and the role that it has played in the in the area that you were describing and, and what role it will play going forward? Um, you know, the natural resource NRCS funding wetland reserve easement program is to take land out of production that is essentially marginal or, or not. Um, the long term agricultural future in this area is compromised by saltwater intrusion, just the market itself, um, you know, the, the hay market, um, there's a lot of change happening here. So it's, a, it's honestly, it's a huge transition for a lot of these landowners. Um, they're not delighted about this. Uh, this isn't gonna be the, the folks who, um, this, is, this is a hard transition for a lot of these landowners. So they, they realize that, you know, Honestly, the writing is kind of on the wall in terms of their long-term future. So they're working with us. And over time, they have become allies <laughs> when they see what the restoration looks like. But um, there will not be a lot of agriculture. If, if we do our job, um, it, it, it won't be the landscape it has been for the last, since the 1880s. Oh, thanks for saying that so clearly, because I think that there's a lot of there's different landscapes that the three of you described at different elevations. John, yours is at sea level. Um, so it really is, is a different thing than some of the hillsides that you uh, showed us, Dina, and for sure ridge lines that you showed us, Aaron. So difference of um, uh, different things happening at different elevations, uh, for sure. Um, Tom, is there anything that you would like to ask as we wrap up uh, the Q&A section? Yeah, I, I would love to just hear about uh, uh, your partners, and maybe I could just quickly ask, what could you, what can you not do without them? What, what's the first thing that comes to your mind, Dina? What, what would you say? Well, around the ponds, it would be, like I mentioned, the ranchers, uh, and the there's a, yeah. So, so, and then the NRCS and our local RCD offices because they have. Um, the local offices have programmatic permits that we use that we just we couldn't we couldn't really do this work without them and then we get matching funds and it's just uh and then the tenant takes on the responsibility they're the ones that go into contract with the nrcs to get the work done so it's just it's a it's an essential they're essential all of them thank you aaron 
Yeah, I think I think the partners all highlight are, you know, um, Justin Fields, our grazing tenant. Um, the cows do a lot of ecosystem work and, you know, they have a business to run and cows like to do what they want to do. So um, to, to get the ecosystem services we need, we need that relationship. Um, I touched on our partnership with the, the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency, and they help fund and manage many of the listed species on the property. So partners in habitat restoration funding, we have a little bit more of an emphasis on public access on this property. And then finally, um, you know, be, through the Valley Habitat Agency, there's a lot of conservation science going on, uh, monitoring the success of the habitat plan system. So folks like Stu um, can help advise us on those, uh, you know, very rare and special, uh, you know, plant and, and listed species population. So it, it, it takes a community, I think, is my main message. Like it. Thank you. John. I want to give a shout out to the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority, um, our Measure AA dollars at work. Together, Bay Area played such an important role in getting Measure AA passed in 2016, right? Yeah. This is their first acquisition project. The Restoration Authority has funded a lot of restoration, but this is the first one where they're helping us purchase land. But that's $7 million total purchase, $21 million to do all the restoration. So they're not only helping to fund the actual on the ground um, work, but also some staff time. So just such a terrific program comprehensive funding um, that NRCS is also kicking in on. So it's it's the money, Tom. That's exciting. First out of the gate, Annie. Awesome. Well, um, again, join me in thanking Dina, Aaron, and John for their storytelling, their pictures, their adorable videos of swimming salamanders. Um, and the, and we're, we'll be back to you, John, for presentation uh, for pictures um, some future later date. Um, so please join me in thanking them. Um, we've been hearing about local um, and in these three cases, really hyper-local um, projects that uh, really are um, uh, on the ground examples of how Together Bay Area members are, are implementers and are making a difference in their local communities. Um, Together Bay Area works at a different scale. We work at a regional scale. Um, and uh, I want to highlight two things that we're doing as we coordinate and, and connect the region. Um, uh, one is, uh, and I'm going to just reiterate some of the things that Jess and Tom said earlier. One is that we're collecting project information to help make the case for funding, building on what John just said about how important uh, things like the Restoration Authority, and I'll extend that to the State Coastal Conservancy Bay Program, are to the region. Um, we are collecting project information to help tell the story about what projects could be implemented if agencies like the State Coastal Conservancy were funded significantly and on an ongoing basis. So um, I invite you to go learn more about that effort, that solicitation for project information, the link in the chat. Thank you, Laura. Um, and also to submit your projects. Um, the more projects we have, uh, the the, to share, to help tell the story, the more effective we'll be in, in bringing more funding to the region. So that's one of the ways that Together Bay Area um, coordinates the region, but also advocates for regional funding. Um, and then uh, the other uh, thing I just wanted to reiterate was something Tom shared around setting regional goals um, for biodiversity conservation and for species habitats. Um, the Conservation Lands Network um, is uh, continuing. Um, it started in the early 2000s. Uh, CLN 1.0 was released in 2011, a progress report in 2014. Uh, CLN 2 was launched in the, towards the end of 2019. Um, and uh, we are just beginning to embark on the process of creating CLN 3.0. And that's a, a five-year process, so don't think that that's coming next week. Um, uh, and because it's it's a long process because of something Tom said earlier around involving a lot of people. We're going to double the number of people that are involved in the CLN and to include new uh, and different voices that haven't been included before. So a really exciting project that's about to start. And I invite you um, to learn more about Together Barry's work um, for regional habitat goals and to coordinate the region towards um, to reach that 
conserving 50% by 2050 goal um, on our website. So that's some of the stuff we're doing in addition to holding events like today. Um, and so you've heard about local, uh, you've heard just a little bit about regional, and now we wanna bring to the stage um, uh, Deputy Secretary of Habitat, uh, Assistant Deputy Secretary of Habitat, Madeline Drake, um, who's gonna join me to talk about um, how the, the local connects to regional connects to state. Um, and uh, let's see if I can, um, Madeline, are you, there you are. I'm here. There you are. Hi, Madeline. Thank you so much Hi. for joining us from, Absolutely. Kind of sac from Sacramento to the Bay Area. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been great to hear about these amazing projects. So thanks for having me. Oh, it's a total pleasure to have you. Um, uh, so we've been talking about multi-benefit projects. You heard, you know, lots of different ways that this has been talked about this morning um, that certainly include biodiversity, but they're not solely about biodiversity. Aaron talked about uh, public access. Dina talked about ag and working lands and, and biodiversity and public access and how they all come together. Um, can you tell us how these local projects connect to what the work that you and your colleagues at California Natural Resources Agency are doing at the state level? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, here in the Biodiversity and Habitat team, uh, one of the main initiatives that I work on is our state's 30 by 30 initiative to conserve 30% of land and coastal waters by 2030. Uh, and our sort of key priorities under that initiative are um, to protect and restore biodiversity, which there are many great stories about today, uh, to mitigate and build resilience to climate change and to expand equitable out door access. Uh, and so we do have um, other deputy secretaries here at CNRA working on a variety of those portfolios. Um, but yeah, these multi-benefit projects really help broaden all of those things, right? Um, and so fit really closely in um, to the work we're doing for 30 by 30 to advance um, conservation throughout the state. So, and I'm excited to hear about your 50 by 50 goal. That's awesome. Uh, and, and look forward to following and tracking that. And um, yeah, so, you know, for 30 by 30, it's a, a locally led voluntary goal. And so we won't achieve the goal without projects like the ones we've heard today, um, because it's it's not a state mandate, right, that saying, you know, we're going to take this land or that land or anything. It's not a land grab. It's, um, you know, how can we all do this together and work together uh, and get conservation done? So um, it, it's projects exactly like the ones we've heard today that are really going to get uh, as an aggregate to uh, the state goal. I, I used to work on threatened and endangered species in my previous role uh, almost um, exclusively, and I felt like uh, a lot of the reasons they were imperiled were, um, you know, what I'd hear the term death by a thousand cuts, uh, but why I like working on 30 by 30, why I like hearing my projects is it feels like life by a thousand heels, and so um, it's so great to hear uh, about the work you all are doing, and that really full up and fits into, um, you know, how we're trying to empower local leaders to get that conservation done. So, um, yeah, keep up the great work, everybody, because uh, it's, it's things that make me happy and, and I hope are inspiring and will really help us with these biodiversity climate crises. That's great. I love life by a thousand heels. Um, I'm going to use that one. Uh, what's the, so 30 by 30 was a start in California with a with an executive order by the governor, mm -hmm. how many years ago? And was that 20? 2020. 2020. Was the, yes, was the executive order, the end of 2020, yes. So 2020, we're so here we are. In. <laughs> yeah, so here we are almost three years in. And uh, what's the, like, where's that initiative now? Like, what's the latest kind of, what's the current state of play for 30 by 30? Yeah, great question. Well, we are uh, really focused on implementing our Pathways to 30 by 30 strategy. Uh, and so that's the strategy that we as a state came up with um, to help us achieve our goal. Uh, so that was actually released in April of 2022, after almost a year of uh, public engagement to really um, make a document that everybody felt represented in uh, and included in. Um, so again, because we have to rely on that local voluntary conservation to meet the goal. Um, so, you know, that came out 
out April 2022. We've been full speed ahead getting that implemented. Um, we're very fortunate to have received um, $1.4 billion in the state's budget over the last couple of years uh, in a, a pot of money called the Nature-Based Solutions Funding. Um, and so that's sort of been spread out through um, the departments and conservancies within the California Natural Resources Agency um, to, to really sort of almost be a down payment to help us get um, 30 by 30 achieved, which is great. And, um, you know, we just released this past spring uh, our first update to our Pathways to 30 by 30 strategy, uh, adding 631,000 acres in the past year. And that's from a combination of both new lands being conserved and improved um, mapping efforts. So you were, we're marching on the path and uh, we have 5.5 million acres to go on land, about half a million uh, acres to go in our coastal waters. So, uh, yeah, we're continuing to implement that strategy and empower our, our local leaders to get more work done. Say those numbers again, five, five, five and a half million? Five, yes, five and a half million on lands uh, and a half a million in our coastal waters. That's that's the goal. That's, yes. Um, got it. That's great. Uh, this may be a self-serving question, yeah. and I'm just going to call it as such <laughs> and name it. How does regional coordination fit into this, <laughs> into the state's work, you know, um, and uh, it's a total fish, I, I will admit, but I'm really <laughs> curious to like how, because it, it, the, it, the work does happen at the local scale. The folks here watching and, and participating in this conversation are the on the ground implementers of it. Um, so I'm curious kind of how, what you see the role of regional co um, coordination, because um, at some level it's like, it's about on the ground work, but what's, what, yeah, tell me about what that means to you. Yeah, well, to us, it's very, very important. Uh, we are a team of two here at the, the uh, Biodiversity and Habitat team at the California Natural Resources Agency. We do have a new fellow, so that makes us three um, for the next 11 months. So we're a very small team. And, um, you know, we can't get this big goal done with only three of us. So it's really our local regional groups uh, that, that are really helping us, uh, you know, achieve this goal. And I don't know everything. I know my boss doesn't know everything. So, you know, we don't know the, the best ways to implement conservation all throughout the state. We're a big state. We're so biodiverse, which I love. Um, lots of different people, lots of different species, different habitats. Um, but that means that one size doesn't fit all. So, you know, one difficult thing about making a strategy for a place so big as California um, is, is it's a little bit difficult to capture everything, every different way you can get conservation done. So those regional efforts, we we see is like a, a very, very key piece of uh, getting 30 by 30 done because uh, we can't, we just can't do it alone. Um, and so, you know, those regional efforts can really hone into what makes sense for the Bay Area, which is probably going to be very different from what makes sense for the desert. Um, and so, yeah, we need those local leaders. Annie Burke's a part of our um, 30 by 30 partnership coordinating committee, which has local leaders from across the state um, so that we know how can we empower you? How can we give you the tools from our end um, so that you know we can all work together and really get it done. So we see regional coalitions, regional groups is, is very central um, to, to achieving 30 by 30. It's great. I, I, it makes a lot of sense um, to me. It really what you shared really uh, resonates not just because of the work that I do, but also because it 30 by 30 are two numbers. 30%, 20, 30, and that's so simple um, at one level. And uh, at most other levels, it's really not that simple or that easy. Um, and California is such a large and complex state, um, both from the biodiversity perspective, landscapes, topography, not even to mention the human elements of, of the diversity of the state. Um, it's one of the reasons why I love living here, and it uh, makes it really challenging to implement um, something as big and bold as 30 by 30. So um, we all have a, a role to play. Um, uh, how are projects counting towards 30 by 30? And I think th I know that this is a topic uh, that's bigger than, you know, in the next few minutes, um, but I would love to just hear from you. Um, you know, that there's not only one way um, and what, what does that look like and how do, how do projects, including the three that we just heard from, how do they, how do they count? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, 
30 by 30 is a numeric goal at its core, right? In the name of it. And so um, that was one of the first sort of like, how are we going to count it? And, and how do we figure that out? And so that's why we really did spend that year of, um, you know, public engagement to help us answer that as well, because it is such a complex question. Um, so, you know, with a lot of feedback, we did come up with a conceptual definition of what that means. And um, you can check out our pathway it's a 30 by 30 document to really read that in depth. But, um, you know, there was then the question of how do you map that, right, and, and sort of actually count those up. And so um, the best sort of available data set that we came up with was the, um, the California Conservation Easement Database and the California Protected Areas Database um, managed by a group um, Green Info Network. And so uh, it's working very closely with them to make sure that they're up to date and, um, you know, our partners are able to easily provide information. So we've been working with them on a 30 by 30 tool toolkit um, to help partners, uh, you know, best record that information. But it that sort of gets into like the land drawn on a line, right? But there's so many other ways that you can contribute. So um, restoration projects are very important because if we want to actually meet the, the sort of core purpose of 30 by 30 for biodiversity, climate and access, it has to be managed in a way and it has to um, really sort of provide those benefits that we're looking for. So restoration and connectivity and um, you know even things that might not be managed specifically for biodiversity have a place to play because if 70% of the world um, was paved over with concrete, that wouldn't be a great place to live in either. So, you know, I think uh, there's so many ways you can contribute, even just by knowledge, right? Um, you know, are, do we have the right data available? You know, I know uh, Aaron talked about, um, you know, survey one, two, three and community science pieces, right? So there's so much more uh, than just the lines on the land, but um, that is how we are counting. And so, um, you know, I encourage you, if you do know lines that should count, make sure, check out our mapping tools, make sure they are counted, check out the toolkit if they aren't so that we can get them appropriately counted. Um, but yeah, there's so many ways to, to contribute and be a part of this effort. Speaking of, what are some of the ways? Um, what are the <laughs> Any events coming up per chance that absolutely participated? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the easiest way I would say is to join our mailing list. You're going to learn all about, you know, our latest webinars, our latest events. Um, we have a social media. You can see um, success stories and action and um, blog posts from partners and um, funding opportunities when they become available. Um, so that's on our website, californianature.ca.gov. Um, definitely check that out and join the mailing list. But our next big event is our 30 by 30 partnership event uh, that's happening in person in Riverside this year. So um, I hope many of you attended our Sacramento kickoff of our 30 by 30 partnership last year. Um, this year, we're going to Southern California and we hope to sort of move around the state to make sure that, um, you know, we are being inclusive and, and sort of meeting partners from all over the place. So uh, we do hope that if you're able to travel, you can join us in Riverside this year. Um, there are travel stipends available uh, and it, it'll really be a place to connect and celebrate and sort of could create solutions um, to help us achieve 30 by 30. Uh, we have some great speakers lined up uh, to learn from, to uh, workshops so you can kind of get all those questions answered hopefully that are tricky um, places to achieving conservation um, and just time to really get to know each other and, and sort of be in person because uh, we've done a lot of virtual which has brought a lot of access and opportunity um, but this is our one time of year where we really want to bring everyone together. Excellent well I really look forward to being there. Um, I look forward to visiting another part of the state that I don't know very well and, and really um, look forward to seeing colleagues from across the state so that's um, October 11th and 12th um, in Riverside. And um, we can share some more information about that at, in our follow-up materials. Um, thank you, Madeline, for the work that you're doing, your team's doing to Dr. Jennifer Norris and her leadership on 30 by 30. Um, one of the things that gives me a lot of hope about 30 by 30 is that it's really a a tailwind instead of a headwind. Um, the work that everybody does here that we certainly heard about today um, is it's really challenging work. It's super complicated. And I see some, some uh, additional challenges noted in the chat. You know, that's a lot of pushes and pulls, um, housing and conservation and ag and open space and recreation. And um, there's just, it, it's hard work. It's really, really hard work. If it were easy, it would have been done a long time ago. Um, and what 30 by 30 does for us is uh, 
create an umbrella for all of us to get under. Uh, it, it tells a story that we can rally around and use to talk to people who aren't in the business. Um, and we can also uh, leverage 30 by 30 to advocate for funding um, for the region, um, for the state, uh, for the work that we're talking about today. Um, and I see a note in the chat also about the importance of stewardship and stewardship and ongoing and ma uh, ongoing maintenance funding. Um, and that's really important. So something that we're working on together, Bay Area. And um, anyway, all to say, thank you for being here and thank you for your leadership. We, we it, our work is easier because of the work that you're all doing. So thank you. And we look forward to supporting you going forward. Please join me in thanking Madeline for joining us today. And um, just as we wrap up uh, before lunchtime today, I, I wanna say thank you to our speakers. I also wanna say thank you to all of our Together Bay Area members who are here. Um, there are over 70 member organizations. And if you work for one of those organizations, then you are a Together Bay Area member too. Um, it's not just one or two people within these organizations, but really everybody um, from fundraising, communications to project managers, senior leadership, et cetera, are all really a uh, really important part of the work that we do as a region um, to reach our regional goals. So thank you for being members. And if your organization is not yet a member, now is a great time to join. Um, this is my KQED pitch of the day. Um, and I just really want to encourage you to learn more about what it means to be a member. Um, there's a lot of work that we're doing with and for our members um, that directly benefits their, their on the ground work. Um, and we're also building a regional, we're, we're coordinating regionally and so that we have colleagues around the region that you can connect with and learn and ask questions. We go on field trips um, where a whole lot of really interesting work happens. Um, and we're advocating for funding, we're doing all kinds of things. I invite you to go um, check out uh, the website with more information. Um, there's 100% chocolate involved in everything we do in real time. Sorry that we haven't figured that out here in the Zoom land, but um, I, we, we would love to uh, include all of the people here and the work that we're doing. So invite you to learn more. Again, um, thank you to my colleagues for making this possible, to our today's speakers, and all of you for being here today. It's time for lunch. Thank you for joining, and we hope to see you at the next Together Tuesday in October. Take good care. <laughs>